Dear all, I would like to begin by thanking all those who have made this thesis possible. My family, my friends, my colleagues, those who have given me criticism and inspiration, and all those who in various ways have given me the opportunity to delve deeply into a frightening and fascinating period of Norwegian and European history. I would especially like to thank the committee for giving the thesis what I perceive as a generous, just, and thorough evaluation. When I began work on this thesis, I carried with me an impression of the and the wartime Norwegian police formed by the increasingly harsh criticism of the police in scholarly works and in the wider public debate from the 1980s onwards. This criticism centered on the undeniable fact that most of the Jews living in Norway and ultimately killed in Auschwitz had first been arrested by Norwegian police officers. To many who studied these events, including me, the intuitive reasons seem clear. The Norwegian police arrested the Jews because they were others and not members of the Norwegian national community. As I dived deeper into the sources, I be began to subtly reconsider my assumptions. Most crucially, it became quite clear to me that the arrests of the Jews were not an anomaly. Rather, they were the most consequential examples of a larger pattern. When orders came from the occupying power, Norwegian police officers, with very few exceptions, carried these orders out, at least nominally. That meant that Norwegian police officers with different ideological views, did not only arrest Jews, but also protesting teachers, resistance members, and people conscripted for forced labor. Put differently, it increasingly struck me that it would in fact have been more surprising if they had openly protested when the order came to arrest the Jews. And while there are certainly examples, and I have found more, of anti-Semitism and stereotypes against about Jews among Norwegian police officers, this appeared to me not the primary reason why so many Jews were arrested by Norwegian policemen. Having come to this conclusion, the natural question of course became, why did this pattern emerge? What made Norwegian police officers unwilling or unable to avoid carrying out questionable or even horrible orders? Was it because their ranks were filled with devoted national socialists? Or were there other reasons? And to which extent did nominal obedience mask various forms of secret opposition by police officers. Here, a complex picture gradually emerged with many factors interacting to produce the end results. In early 1941, a prison transport left the town of Stavanger bound for Oslo. It was one of the first such transports from the town. On board were two well-known opponents of the Nazi, new Nazi rulers of Norway, editor Trond Hegna, author of the widely read article, No Norwegian for Sale, Ingen Norman Tesalgs, and Moritz Rabinowitz, whose pu public warnings about the dangers of Nazism and Jewish background made him enemy number one for the Germans in the county of Ogaland. But on the transport were also seven police officers from Stavanger. Their crime being identified as the most prominent anti-Nazi voices in the Stavanger police which was enough to be arrested by the German security police. One of them, foolhardy enough to refuse to sign a declaration of loyalty, ended up in the concentration camp Sachsenhausen for the rest of the war. The effects imprisonment could have on people were succinctly summed up by Torleif Carlsen, who after the war became a very famous and prominent Norwegian policeman, who was one of those arrested. He wrote in his prison diary, and I quote, my reserves of humor and patience are almost at an end. It looks like the point is to keep us here for months as a warning to like-minded people. 
The investigations are almost certainly finished. None of us have been interrogated for the, in the, for the last four weeks. We watch to find whether outside, sitting here as prisoners who have committed no crime. Is there no one willing and able to help us get out? If they had told us we would remain here for three months, that would have been better. Then we could have counted down the days, but now we can only add new ones. To me, this episode was a vivid illustration of the kind of pressure Norwegian police officers faced. Leaders of the occupation regime, both German and Norwegian, saw a politically reliable police as crucial and worked throughout the war to make this a reality. Tolerance for signs of unreliability was correspondingly low. In my thesis, I delved deeper into the lives of police officers in three towns, Stavanger, Olesund, and Sheen. In all of them, police officers experienced political cleansings, with many colleagues removed for suspected resistance activity or mere political unreliability. In Sheen, a reserve constable was imprisoned and fired for saying, I can't take this anymore, this is terror, in the presence of a German security police officer when ordered to arrest a local girl. In other words, police officers knew very well that they walked on a tightrope with the wrong word in the wrong company could land them in trouble. From August 1943, the danger they were in was spelled out plainly in the form of a new law. Refusing to carry out an, an order now became potentially punishable by death. This atmosphere is obviously crucial for understanding why political of police officers acted as they did. No one thought about the possibility of seeing the inside of a German prison or even a concentration camp with joy. But still, it does not explain everything. Most notably, by autumn 1942, police officers had already been through enough to see that police service in, in, in occupied Norway was morally dubious, if one did not share the goals of the new National Socialist rulers of Norway. Despite this, there was no exodus of non-Nazi police officers from the force, a fateful decision which would uh, and, uh, make many of them perpetrators during the Holocaust. Why? Before he had to flee Oslo on 9th April 1940, Minister of Justice Taivol had time to give the Chief of Police in Oslo, Christian Wellhaven, one clear order. Two, under all circumstances, remain at his post, meet the German forces, and defend the interests of the people in the best possible manner. With that, he set the tone for the government's attitude towards the police. Obeying this order was uncontroversial for most police officers. In the interval period, they had been told again and again that they had to carry out tasks that they personally found distasteful. They were used to compromise with their own views and even values for a higher purpose, a higher principle, that of maintaining law and order. Reflecting this instinct to be the last to abandon ship, the police acted more or less in the same way all over the country. They remained in their positions, acting as a mediating actor between the occupier and the population. Despite the difficult and compromising position, this left them in. Crucially, this basic attitude that even anti-Nazi police officers should remain in their positions for as long as possible, never changed. Notably, while the government for in exile, for example, very clearly condemned joining the Norwegian Nazi party national assembling, police duty as such was never officially deemed unpatriotic or illegal. The same applies to the resistance leadership that eventually emerged in Norway. In 1943, Following the execution of police prosecutor Egeno Eilefsen for the disobeying an order, a resistance group consisting of police officers formally asked the leadership of the civil resistance whether it was not now better to urge every non-Nazi police officer to quit the force. The answer was clear. Police officers were so valuable for shielding the population and aiding the resistance effort that they should remain at their posts. But they acknowledged that police officers would as a consequence, carry out illegitimate orders up to a certain degree. This view did not come out of nowhere. I have found numerous examples of policemen offering such aid to people in danger, including some Jews. Help from insiders in the police was crucial for many working in the resistance. 
But such acts by a brave minority also provided the wider police with an alibi, preventing it from being deemed beyond redemption by resistance leaders or the government in exile. Likely comforted by this lack of condemnation, many police officers without sympathies for the Nazi new order, nevertheless continued to dutifully carry out orders from the occupier and as Norwegian henchmen, while not offering them any serious opposition. For some in the Norwegian police, the moral dilemmas of being a policeman in occupied Norway were far easier to deal with because they supported transforming Norway into a society more in line with national socialist ideas. As one of them answered when asked about him arresting political opponents, I saw nothing wrong with it. On the surface, it could seem like the Norwegian police were brimming such, with such people. By January 1941, some 30% of, of police officers were members of National Assembling, and by the end of the war, this number had risen to 40%. Some police cor corps, such as the one in Shein, even collectively joined the party. In reality, however, this number is, was highly misleading. Just to take one example, in Shein, a police officer who acted as the main connection between the different parts of the resistance movement was a member of NS until spring of 1942. But while it would be wholly incorrect to equate the share of NS members in the police with the number of convinced national socialists, the high NS membership rate was still not meaningless. There were a considerable number of national socialists in the, in the force, and they were invariably members of NS, and their presence had important consequences. Some of these uh, of them were veteran policemen who, um, with existing or new found sympathies for NS or even the SS, but many others were recruiting um, during the occupation. Convinced National Socialists were encouraged by Norwegian and German Nazi leaders to join the police and many followed this call. Consequently, by the end of the war, a considerable number of police officers in service had backgrounds such as membership in the paramilitary unit of NS, the HILD, were members of Germansk SS Norge, the Norwegian uh, version of SS, or had fought as SS volunteers on the Eastern Front. They were, however, not equally distributed among the various police units. Dedicated National Socialists often sought employment in the political state police where they could be among ideological compatriots and do the most good in the fight against opponents of the new National Socialist Norway. Internally, the men who threw their lot in with the NS would havoc on cohesion, making it exceedingly difficult to create a common front among police, uh, police officers. Such a strong collective stand would have been the only real, uh, realistic way to muster a potent response against the new demands coming from the top. This was true on the national level, where Jonas Lee, a respected and well-connected policeman recruited by SS leader Heinrich Himmler to notify the Norwegian police, played a particularly disruptive role, but it also applied locally. The seven police officers from Stavanger mentioned earlier primarily ended up in trouble because they were accused of NS supporters among their colleagues of being, of undermining the new order. In Sheen, as NS sympathizer set in motion the events leading to collective membership when he falsely said that police minister Jonas Lee had told union representatives that they had to join NS or lose their jobs. In contrast, Olesen, a police corps notable for his comparatively strong resistance had no influential NS members who could undermine the actions and mood among their mostly anti-Nazi colleagues. Externally, eager National Socialists often proved that the attitude of policemen could make a difference. In my thesis, you will find many examples of them on their own accord reporting people for transgressions, small and large, and eagerly investigate them. And to me, it was particularly jarring to see how many state police officers in Stavanger took the opportunity to buy possessions of Jews they had recently arrested and sent away to a dire fate. Why would you walk around wearing the pajamas of one of them unless you really had no moral qualms about what you had just been part of? 
one of the most striking things I was left with after uh, after delving into the lives of hundreds of police officers was that despite the circumstances, they chose and acted very differently. Some became passive, trying to keep their heads down as best as they could until the storm had passed. Others, however, threw themselves into the tempest. Among the people I studied, there is one who succumbed in night and fog in Natsweiler, another who met his death in front of a firing squad, and two who were killed by the resistance uh, for their actions during the, uh, for their work for the occupier. A few tortured their countrymen in almost unfathomably cruel ways. And as a man, it was positively awful to read the witness describe how a Norwegian policeman crushed his testicle. Explaining what moved people in so different directions, however, has proven difficult. For several reasons, many were tight-lipped about what they had, why they had acted as they did. And even if they had been more outspoken, one of course had, would have to take their explanations with a large grain of salt, as people often have difficulties deciphering and describing their true motivations. Nevertheless, some explanations can be offered. First of all, as hinted at earlier, peer pressure clearly played an important role. Many primarily oriented themselves to be in line with their colleagues. Consequently, what became the dominant actions and attitudes in each police force was important for determining how most local policemen acted. Given this, the choices and attitudes of formal or informal leaders among the men was also crucial. They often set the tone, dragging others with them. The most dramatic example of this is Chief of Police Christian Rönning Tönnesen in Kristiansand, who was joined by almost his entire for a corps when he resigned in protest against what he saw as unreasonable demands from the new police ministry. Once he was removed, however, most of his men returned to their jobs. But some went beyond or even against the patterns dominating among their colleagues. Some showed an almost reckless willingness to offer resistance, something few others would do. Others showed far greater brutality than their colleagues, and yet others more ideological zeal. In such cases, it was interesting to look closer at the personalities and personal histories of such people to the extent the sources permitted it. Doing so revealed some interesting tendencies. For example, People who ended up as dedicated national socialists during the war usually did not come out uh, come from out of nowhere, but had shown far right sympathies already in the 1930s. Another, there was not a systematic correlation between ideological seal and willingness to use violence or even torture against prisoners. Several very dedicated national socialists were described as decent by former prisoners. Instead, the temperament of a person and the company they ended up with seems far more important for leading people down the path of violence. According to historian Beret Neckleby, if there was one thing Norwegians learned during the war, it was that unity provided strength, and that such unity could also force the weak to stay on the right side. Such unity produced several spectacular resistance successes, successes in wartime Norway, such as the sports strike, and the internationally acclaimed protests of the teachers. Common for these was strong, principled leadership and overwhelming support for their line of resistance among their rank and file. The Norwegian police lacked both. And when combined with far greater pressure from above than what the aforementioned groups, groups experienced, the results were unsurprisingly poor. But even given this overall picture, police officers were a varied group. Even in an increasingly coercive environment, space existed for people to make a difference in one way or another, if they wanted to. And for some people in, sites, in the sites of the police, the choices of police officers proved the difference between life and death. And as such, the history of the Norwegian police during the war is both a cautionary tale and an inspiring one. Thank you. <laughs>